Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We've been given so many gifts this weekend, and I think the gift has already been given and packaged and the ribbons around it, and my job is just to hold my little finger on the first tie of the ribbon so God can make the bow. <laughs> so I just I feel very humbled and honored and um, happy to be here and um, putting my finger on the ribbon so the bow can be made. Um, anyway, um, did anybody peek? <laughs> Uh, they said don't, and I want to, but uh, so um, if they say just open it up and don't worry about it, it's a surprise, but, you know, pretend like you didn't, then everybody go, oh, no, I want a surprise. Um, little condom that we got here. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I just, uh, it's just been so wonderful, and the 12 step is absolutely one of my absolute favorites. Um, Sandy talked about staying on course, and the way I I like to think of staying on course to get to having some sort of awakening is I um, there's this hallway that I go down, and much of the time, um, and when I'm new, I'm banging off both sides of the hallway, like just hard, because I'm so rebellious, and and, uh, I'm trying to re-groove a record. I don't know if you've ever tried to re-groove a record, but... You know, most of you guys don't know what vinyl is anymore, sorry, but, you know, if it's got that skip on it, and every time you play that, just, you know, it's it's Janice singing, and it skips right in peace of my heart, you know, don't do that, so you got to just hold your finger on the needle ever so perfectly, so it starts to make a new groove over that skip, and, it, and it's kind of painful, and it takes some pressure, but eventually the, the needle will, ma- will go through that groove and give you some music. And that's kind of the way I learned how to stay on course in Alcoholics Anonymous. Is kind of, somebody had to put their finger on me and just kind of gently regroove through that hard vinyl, make a new trail for the needle to follow. And, and I bounce off this side of the wall, just bruise the heck out of myself. And then you know, then I kind of stand course in the middle for a little bit, and then I go bounce off the other side of the hallway and bruise myself and batter myself and get bloody with the defects and the rebellion and the self-centeredness. And then eventually, as my sponsor says, watch for, watch for the, the road, watch for the path as you travel in through the middle to beat yourself up on the other side. So somewhere, oh, awareness, oh, there's the path. Okay, here I go. I'm going to beat myself up on the other side and knock me out. So that's kind of how I learned is just how to, maybe I'll kind of feel the hallway come. You know, I just, and I don't have to just graze it a little and then come back in the groove. And then I graze the other side and come back in the groove. I don't have to beat myself up so much more to get in the middle of the road. And there's a big path between both sides of the wall. Big path. I like to stay smack in the center because that's where Santa Claus is. <laughs> My son had a little toy when he was little, and you would push it really fast, and, and it was a Christmas tree, and it would if you got the speed right, it would open up, and inside was Santa. And it's like, that's where I want to be, right in the middle of this thing in Santa's lap, you know, telling him what I want, you know, but safe and secure in the middle of this thing. Um, so the 12th step is uh, always, I mean, by the time I got to the 12th step, Sandy talked a lot about grace. Um, you know, we've, we've laughed our way through this weekend. We've, you know, we've opened our hearts up through this weekend. We've, you know, we've made friends through this weekend. We've taken a hard look at some things through this weekend. And, um, you know, Sandy opened up the, the, the word grace. And, and as everybody else did, too, any any kind of opening up that happened this weekend is is a piece of grace because um, you know the bricks have been talked about and the and the walls have been um, rebuilt and torn down and rebuilt and torn down and and I want those spiritual muscles so that when I reach for that heavy piece of cinder block you know it's like I pick it up and it just I don't know if I want to put it in my life again you know it took so much to 
have those spiritual muscles to take it out of there? And how did I get to the point of being able to take those cinder blocks out of my life that, that just make it so hard? What are the bricks between me and that bottle of Jose Cuervo gold? What are they? It's a lot of working with others. It's a lot of God. It's a lot of staying in the middle of the road. It's, um, it's a lot of showing up when I don't know I have anything to give. It's a lot of commitments. It's, it's a lot of getting on my knees. It's a lot of answering the phone late at night. It's a lot of getting in the car and driving to Oildale. It's a lot of that kind of stuff that I, that keep me flexible and keep me a seeker. I am a seeker. I was a little girl in Iowa sitting in the soybean field seeking the mothership. There was something inside of me long before I took a drink that was a seeker. And, uh, and I'm a more drinker. I'm a tequila drinker. I'm a Jack Daniels drinker. I like Harleys. I like dark, rowdy bars. I like loud jukeboxes. I like moving in the middle of the night to Florida. I like, I like the lights of the carnival. You know, I like my organic patch that I grooved and grow out in the middle of Wisconsin on great seed. I like laying there all day long and eating it. I like, I, I'm just kind of that kind of a more gal. You know, if it's good, let's do more. And in sobriety, I'm not disappointed. I'm not disappointed because that piece of grace that got me at 31 days when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I don't, I don't stay sober. I'm at Fort Walton Beach Officers Club. I've got 14 shots of tequila lined up. It's the 4th of July. I am the only female in there. I'm being taken care of. But I've got to go into the bathroom, lock the door, and take my bottle out of my bag and hit on it because I don't get enough. I don't get enough. There is not a, a satiation point with me anymore where... I have enough. I just, I'm, I'm seeking, I'm looking, I'm running, I'm intense. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, I got to see the gift of walking into a meeting on August 20th, 1975, when I woke up a drinker and I went to bed a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Not looking for it, not wondering about it, not knowing I'm an alcoholic, but it was my day. I was surrendered by alcohol. I was at that point where there was no friendly direction, as my sponsor says. And I picked up the phone to call my mother with my jaw broken in three places and my nose and a victim of violent crime and sucking on cheap wine through the wires on the mouth where the tooth had been kicked out. And I'm a drinker. And I call my mom because the guy that was letting me stay there said I'd have to leave. I was depressing him. And... um, (laughs) My mom said, no, Sharon, go to the Salvation Army, and that was a piece of grace. Because if she would have sent $20 by seconds and inches, you'd have another speaker. And the pieces of grace that led me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous where somebody raised my hand, where they looked at me and went, look at her. She looks surrendered. Maybe she'll make it. They were glad. They didn't spend a lot of time with me. They just kind of shuffled me around. And at 31 days of sobriety, I'm going to these meetings because they're picking me up. They say, don't drink and use in between, we'll pick you up. I couldn't say anything for three months because I was wired shut. So I just, and I was tired. I was blessedly tired. I think of August 21st, maybe I would have had a plan. But on August 20th, I had no plan. And God came into my life in a moment of grace with a lot of little breadcrumbs leading me to my solution for my disease of alcoholism that I didn't even know I had. And that's a precious gift. That's an amazing day. And we've each one had that day. And uh, 31 days, I'm raising my hand because i got to raise my hand to stay here. That's what someone told me. You know, like I said, I can't talk. I have to just information's coming my way all the time. People felt they could talk to me because I couldn't talk back. And (laughs) my mind was racing like, you guys talk so much about yourselves. Nobody asked me about me. I had the newspaper clipping in my pocket ready to go unemployed bartender from New Orleans was beaten up in Palm Springs. I'm ready to pull it out and show you. Nobody asked. They just, ah, she looks tired. Now, your turn to take her to the coffee shop tonight. Uh, But at 31 days, my hand, I went, and there was a little feeling of warmth and light, and I guess it was grace. And I went, I don't stay sober 31 days. For just a moment, the power 
gave me that wind of a kiss. And uh, uh, that did something different inside me that I didn't realize had done something. It had opened up a little bit of a channel, just a little bit of an innocent channel. And um, over the years, those moments started to come more and more. And I didn't look at them like moments of grace. Uh, I guess they were moments of awareness. They, um, they came at me in many different ways. They came at me in, in ways of uh, when my son was born. Um, I was thinking about the word awake, and I used to love to watch him wake up when they're that innocent and they're that little. And I used to love to watch him wake up because he would do it slowly, more, you know, smile on his face, and eyes not even open yet. And uh, he would open them slowly and just kind of maybe be aware of his surroundings, which were comfortable and safe and warm. And then he would see me and he would break into the biggest smile. And I think that's how we bring ourselves to God. Just slowly and uh, with the biggest smile. I'm so happy to know that the joy of living, that's what we're here for, is to bring that joy of living into every single area of our life. To bring that light. And um, I was thinking about Don Prince. I used to tell a story. Oh, I love this story. About the little boy, much like Clint's story, the little boy who knew there was another one coming, you know, and he had all the attention until the other one was coming. And uh, he kept saying to his mom, you know, here it is in the belly, and it's a baby's going to come, and you're going to, you know, have a new little sister. And he was all excited about it. He could feel her move and all that. But when the little girl came home from the hospital, he didn't get any more attention, but he kept saying to mom, mom, I gotta, I, I gotta spend some time with her. And you know, they were looking at him acting out a little bit and worried about him being alone with her, but he kept wanting to spend some alone time with his little baby sister. So they just kind of kept him away and didn't think much about it. And as she gets older and, you know, a little more stable, they didn't want to let him in the room alone with her. And one morning the mother got up early and he was in there. And so she, For a minute, she thought, okay, well, you know, is he thumping her on the head? (laughs) Um, And she listened at the door, and she heard the little boy say to his little sister, quick, tell me about God. I'm starting to forget. And I was like, that's what it is when I work with others. Tell me about God. Show me about God. I don't want to forget. And um, so this joy, no matter what, (laughs) is... um, finds its way into my life by my awareness, by my opening of my eyes, by my opening of my heart. How do I get that heart open? Um, At uh, seven years of sobriety, I remember standing at the podium to take my birthday cake, and I had this feeling of being shot through with love. And I I just really, I burst into so much of a smile. And that was one of the first little experiences I got to see of somebody else experiencing the joy of living. Um, Now, in the, in the, uh, there's, you know, there's all kinds of ways to get to some sort of state of consciousness, of God consciousness, and not self consciousness. And one of the ways I, I know that it was done with me is to, They just kept me entertained long enough before the program started to work, and that's kind of my job with new people sometimes is just to keep them in the room, don't drink, as Sandy said, and keep them entertained long enough for the program to start working. And peer pressure. The peer pressure is good. In our group, there's a lot of peer pressure. There's a girl that has eight days less than me that got more attention when she came into the program because I couldn't talk, I wasn't fun to hang around with, I couldn't eat. Um... And Pat came in eight days after me and sobbed because her husband was sick. And all the old-timers that I desperately wanted them to pat me on the head went over to Pat and gave her tons of attention. And Pat was going through the steps so quickly and so perfectly and always had those old-timers around her. She was always crying. I thought, you're so weak, you know? (laughs) I wasn't going to shed a tear. I don't think if my jaw was... I could have probably kept my jaw shut if it wasn't wired, but um, so much anger was in me. 
But um, Pat had done her all her steps, and I didn't realize her husband was dying of cancer, and it was very important. But this peer pressure of she'd done all the steps. She's ahead of me. She's eight days less than me. And somebody wasn't, I asked this lady named Gail. I said, how do you, I can't start my inventory. She said, I'm sick of you talking about it. You pick up that thousand pound pencil and you go home and you start writing and I'm sick of you talking about it. You've talked to all of us about it for a month or two. I just thought, screw you. I'm going to go drink at you. And I think I was actually rounding the corner to go to the liquor store and I had a thought. I'll have less time than Pat. <laughs> So peer pressure can work, you know, it really can work. And the joy of it is, is we still celebrate Pat and I, our birthdays every August. I still have those eight days on her. And I tell her that it's, uh, it's quantity, not quality. So, uh. <laughs> but passing all of this on to um, the alcoholic who still suffers is, Nobody can do it but us. And it goes through a whole long thing in the book about how to do it right and, and what to do right. And I, I remember one of my very first 12-step calls. I got sober in 75. We were really having 12-step calls then. They were really, I mean, they were really calling to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. My last 12-step call was an insomniac who, unfortunately, central office gave them my home, home number. So um, that was interesting when I realized she was not an alcoholic and insomniac. Um, but, you know, those real 12-step calls, I'd love to see them coming back. I actually smelled a little alcohol in a meeting a week ago. Somebody knew, and my baby was like, oh, there's someone here drinking. I said, well, hey, hey, honey, let's go find them. Let's go see if we can talk to them. Had never even smelled someone drinking in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's how shined up we get sometimes. So we... um. I went to um, to have this this conversation with this new lady that called, and she was at a very seedy motel. I lived in Inglewood when I was new, so I got all the seedy motels. And I'm a B. They used to use a Rolodex, and they would get to me first. And so I would go find this seedy motel over by the airport, and I drug this lady out and her friend is passed out, her lover is passed out, and drug her out to a meeting, and she had a black eye, and she was drunk and belligerent, and I brought her to Ohio Street. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember sitting by Clint. Clint sat on the other side because he tried to calm her down for me. And I didn't know what to do with her. I was fairly new, and and um, but I got the help I needed to have her have a meeting. I didn't know I could you know, a shisher or whatever. I just thought, I'm doing God's work. I better do it right. And um, so the old timers in the room took over for me, and I I gave it to her that night. I think she was in a blackout, really, but um, I gave her my best and gave her the book and gave her the literature and laid her down on the bed to go to sleep, and he still passed out, and, and I never heard from her again. <laughs> I was brokenhearted. Um, but it was an experience I did not want to miss. It was an experience of going to those seedy motels by a seedy airport, and that's what I did, you know, with the carnival and all my travels on the road and, you know, freedom's just another word and out of my way. I mean, that's what I was. I was that girl with the black eye. I was that lady that was smelling and sick and had no hope. And um, so it was. it renewed my spirit. It awakened my heart. And... Um, the book also talks about maybe it's time sometimes when you have to move on and you've helped somebody so much that they just, they're not getting it. They, you know, they don't want it. And a friend of mine, my very first friend named Sandy, we were very close and new together and going through things about the same time. You know, a buddy is great to have. And Sandy um, got engaged and then he broke it off and she went out. And six months later, she called me, and I said, oh, God, I'm worried about you. Come over, come sleep on my couch, let's go to a meeting. Okay, I'm going to get a job again. Things are going to get good. And she stayed for a couple of weeks, and then I came home one night, and she's gone. And I heard from her maybe a year and a half later, and she was in a recovery home. So I went down and got her and brought her in the meeting. And things are going to be different. I'm going to get a job, and men aren't my higher power anymore, and life is good. And I'm in this recovery home, and they're giving me a chance, and... 
I said, great, you know, I'll, I picked her up for a couple of days, and then she was gone. And I didn't hear from her from, for years, years. And I heard from her from a payphone. And so I said, where are you? She told me where she was. I said, good, let me come get you. Come sleep on my couch. We'll get it going. Make some meetings. She said, no, Sharon, I just want some money. I said, Sandy, come on. You know, you know where it is. You know where the gift is. You know where to come for it. You know what your problem is. It's alcoholism. Of course your head's going to be loud right now. Let's air it out and dry it up and bring you back in. And I, I just, I need some money. I said, Sandy, I can't help you with that. I can't help you with that. She was reduced to needing some money and uh, broke my heart. I had to say no, broke my heart. I said, I had the same, I've had the same phone number for, I think, 30 years. So people still find me, which is a blessing. So I haven't heard she's gone yet, so maybe she'll surface. If they're breathing, we still have hope. Um, so I had to let go. That one was hard. Um, but the, the joy of practicing these principles, what are these principles? <laughs> Well, things like honesty, tolerance, patience, love, courage, forgiveness, perseverance, trust, surrender, acceptance, acceptance, gratitude. Um, I'm so grateful for these enduring principles that we live because I can't live any other way comfortably. I wish I could sometimes. I think, how do they get away with that? <laughs> And somebody one day said to me fairly recently, if you knew how they get away with it, Sharon, you could do it. Don't spend too much time trying to figure it out. Oh, okay, got it. Don't, don't even worry about it. Just bless them and move on. And that made a lot of sense to me. But, um, you know, the, the right action is the key to good living. And taking the right action in my life, like making the amends to my, my, my father. I had made amends and things started to get very, very good. And, I'll tell you when the awareness came in and my defects of character were in my face with a family visit. You know, family's been talked about. We have the family of blood and then the family of understanding, and you're my family of understanding. And the family of blood, no alcoholics in there, just me. And, you know, the Mensa sister and the nurse Sally, who was two, got a nurse kit for Christmas, wanted to be a nurse and lived to Alaska, and that's what she's still doing. Um, she knew it too, what her path was. And my brother, who carried the family name, and then the alcoholic. You know, then there was me, and I was always a source of entertainment. I'm more, they like my friends more now. It's, um, in fact, they've adopted many of my friends, my sober friends. But I went home for my sister's wedding, and I had been through the steps. I had gone through the process of um, the amends with my family, especially with my father, who said I always wanted you to be happy, and took a long time to mend that road. I broke his heart. I was share. I shared and shared alike. He saw a lot of what I was sharing, and it wasn't pretty. And I drug it home and shook it in his face just to hurt that man with the big shoulders who should have been able to fix me. And he couldn't. And I let him close, and I'd push him back. And I'd let him close with my pain. He'd have a solution, and I'd push him back. You know, I brought the priest down to try to help me in college. We got drunk. The priest and I got drunk right in front of my father, who became speechless. Um, but I'm on a plane, and I'm going home, and um, it's just me coming down to, to my sister's wedding in Iowa in the, um, in the summer. And they all were in the van to pick me up, the minivan. You know? <laughs> they were all in the minivan to pick me up. And um, I hadn't had my child yet, so it was before 1984. So I, was, I think I was in the beginning of my financial amends with my father. It was right in that spot. I'm seven, eight years sober. And uh, they picked me up at the airport. I'm so happy to see everybody, and I'm in the minivan, and we live way out in the country, um, three miles outside of Mount Vernon, Iowa, and just a beautiful place, a place that I was ashamed to be of for years, to be from. I was from Wisconsin because they had cheese, you know, it felt more dignified when I was out in the world with my Midwest accent, you know, I couldn't fool them, but Iowa had pigs and corn, and that's how I felt, so I didn't. Wisconsin had cheese. It was more dignified. And so I was never even the person from where I was born. I was, I was uh, a lie much of the time. And we're driving down this beautiful country road off of Highway 1 to get by the Cedar River where my parents lived. 
And all of a sudden, the men's is in the front seat talking to my dad about high finance. My sister, who's getting married, is in the back seat talking with my mom about plans. The brother-in-law, who I just met, is talking to my brother about guy things. And I'm sitting in the middle being ignored. This middle child thing came up again from the roots, from the depth of my taproot. Found its way up, found its way into my gut, found its way past my heart, found its way into my head, found its way into my resentments, found its way into my justifications. And I didn't, and I started sobbing. I started having this cathartic sobbing in the middle of this beautiful country road with my family all around me. And my dad stops the van and turns around and looks at me and goes, are you okay? And everybody's, and this is the moment I've waited for my whole <laughs> life. This is my platform from which I'm going to tell every one of them why my life is so screwed up and that was screwed up and the victim I am and it's your fault. So get ready. I am opening the floodgates. But what happened was a little bit of awareness snuck in there. A little bit of God said, get out of the van. And I heard it, and I got out of the van, and I said, I just need some air. You know, I am cathartic. This is, like, big. This is that uncontrollable sobbing from your toes. And I'm standing outside the van looking at the corn. And I'm just... <laughs> you pigs in there over there smell them. Well, they don't see them. I smell them. They're there, pigs and corn. And I... I have this moment of grace, which is, shut up, don't say anything, breathe. So I looked at the cornfield, and I started to breathe. And I thought, you know, maybe restraint here is the best way to go. It's not my weekend. It's my sister's wedding. And that got through to me. So that I looked at that cornfield, and Casey talks about this, and I love it, that he's not from Iowa, but he gets it. He gets me. He gets me. There's a whole plan to tilling that soil. There's a whole bunch of people have to put stuff in it. Things have to be worked. Things have to be thought out. You can't just rework the soil year after year after year and get a bumper crop. You have to sometimes plow it under. Sometimes leave it alone. Sometimes plant something else that you don't like as much. But the job is, is to pay attention to the soil. And this beautiful cornfield was there. And you can really watch it grow in the summer. You can watch it grow. If you look hard enough at it, whoop, it just shot up a little more. And there's life over the top of a cornfield. There's birds, and there's those little tiny bugs, and there's some light that reflects from the sun. It just soaks it up the sun. It just pulls it in, and there's a light, there's an aura about a cornfield. And I just, for a moment, my eyes opened up, and I had the awareness of perfect, thought-out, cared-for, loved life. And then as I turned to get in back in the van, I calmed down. I saw the rose all laid out just for a second. It's all green and pretty and wavy, but just for a second, I saw that it had been laid out in rows. And there's a plan. There's a big plan to this. And you're in it. Who makes you think you're not in it? Take the victim cloak off. It's so heavy. I felt the heaviness of it. And I was able to leave a lot of that there, right off of Highway 1 in that cornfield that I like to drive by when I go home. I wave at my victim cloak on the scarecrow over in the corner. <laughs> you wear it. You need it. Scare those crows away. 
And the awareness was so perfect because I would have destroyed everything that Alcoholics Anonymous had given me that I was able to be the only example they'll ever see of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment, the seconds and inches of that moment, how I could have trashed everything that Bill and Bob stood for and all the people that gave me rides and couches and love and time and whatever I needed to help me become the person that was sitting in there. What a machine gunned them down. And I thought, thank you, God. Thank you for that moment. Thank you for something I did that morning that maybe allowed me to hear you, allowed me to have you sneak in there. And those kind of moments let me know how powerful God's grace is, how powerful being awake is. Many of you know the story about um, my father and how I, I really, really am the only example that my father ever knew of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and the throwing, I mean, we're like, we're like fly fishermen, you know, they all, all those alcoholics are kind of like swimming by, some are trying to go upstream to find their home ground, and some are just kind of floating with the flow, and Actually, we're out there just kind of fly fishing, and every once in a while we catch one. There's so many people that are suffering from the disease of alcoholism. And if you're in the room, you know, you had that luck of being pulled up on the bank out of that disease. It's just so, by seconds and inches, that we are lucky enough to be in a program of recovery and that we have been given the one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic power, which I don't take lightly. I don't want it some days, but I don't take it lightly. Because that's what was missing in all those years of alcoholics trying to get sober and stay sober was that zest that Bill had to go find Bob. And one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic was the missing link that we've got to take out of here. We've got to keep the chain going. We've got to worry about our chain. We've got to link it up. We've got to hook it up. No matter what color a piece of gold you put in that tapestry in somebody's life, they'll remember it. And my dad, I gave him a lot of the gold threads of Alcoholics Anonymous to weave in his life and to heal his heart, to mend his heart. And he was able to do that, and I was able to do that with him. And the financial amends I made and... For year after year after year, the only example, be on time, don't be late. Practice these principles with your dad. Write him a note about your life. Let him get to know you. Yeah, you're not the Mensa, but so what? You're sharing. You've got gifts to give. This is called practicing. Practice these principles. I used to play the piano, and I had the meanest teacher. She would whack me so that my wrists would be just so. And I, she wouldn't let me play any boogie-woogie. It was always the classics and... And I practiced, and then she broke my spirit, and I didn't practice much anymore. And I went to a recital with her, and I forgot my number. And in front of the recital, she had to come out of the wings, sit down beside me at the piano, and help me through it. But she helped me through it. Now, that was my last recital. I wasn't going back to her. But practice. I practice these principles. I don't, I'm not perfect at them. I practice it. And sometimes in my recital, I need someone to come out and help me through it. And that's what we do for each other. But I had to practice with my dad. I had to let him know about the panels I was on and, you know, this kind of tawdry AA stuff that I thought he would go, oh, God, look at Sharon Spencer, someone in prison. Isn't that fun? You know? <laughs> but my sponsor said, you send that note about your life and you get it to him because you're sending him that check, those financial amends. He may not remember anything else, but he'll remember that his daughter was on time with that check, that he, he was his money back. And after four and three-quarter years, my father said, Sharon, Merry Christmas. Don't send me your money anymore but don't stop sending me your notes. And my life moved on. I had the generosity of the Spirit become between my father and myself. It was um, so much so that, you know, I just that's like just throwing the 
stone in the, the pool and the ripples go. I, I, my, not my job to worry about where the ripples hit. My job is to take a stone and throw it, to try to make a difference where I'm supposed to, to open my eyes where things need to be done, to ask God to show me with my heart, not my squirrel cage of a head. It's like the gerbils. You don't feed them after midnight. You just don't play with them. They're entertainment, as Sandy said, but I don't feed them either. You know, every once in a while I give them a morsel of food and they multiply. Um, so my dad got the end result of Alcoholics Anonymous the step of being an example, being perseverance with my father. Casey talks about his dad who was, oh my goodness, he was a rough guy. <laughs> and I saw the miracle happen in his life with his father before his father died, that he loved me and he loved his son. And uh, nobody thought in Casey's family that was possible. And in my family, I never thought I'd get the innocence back between me and my daddy. And working these steps happened. It happened between me and my father. And I was, you know, I just didn't go home and destroy Alcoholics Anonymous in their lives. I just didn't go home. I, I mean, I, I held it in. I went to meetings. I talked to people on the phone. I remember one Christmas I was home, and it was like I was driving. I'd drive through pay phones in Iowa before cell phones. I'm calling my sponsor from the drive through pay phone at minus 10 degrees, like, you know, three times an hour. But I got through it, and I didn't destroy the relationship that Alcoholics Anonymous had given me by being selfish and self-centered. And my father um, was impressed with you. And my dad read the big book. And the town drunk came to my dad, and I found this out much later. The town drunk came to my father. I loved the town drunk. He'd come and get, you know, when I was in high school, he won a bottle, and my dad had a business, so he had booze. And so I would tell my dad that, you know, he came and he took, I gave him a bottle, but I always said I gave him two because I kept one. So I liked this town drunk. He was a good guy in my life, and he was still a town drunk when I got sober, and evidently he came to my father one day and said, you know, my wife, it's her fault. <laughs> and my dad said, you know what, you've got an alcohol problem. Maybe you should go to Alcoholics Anonymous to help my daughter. It might help you. I don't know anything about this, really, until my mother tells me this later. And I mentioned that at a meeting in Westlake a few years ago, and this young lady came up to me. I thought she kind of looked familiar, but I wasn't sure. Um, she looked like my people, the Czechs, the Czechs from Iowa, and um, the Bohunks. That was another resentment I had to get over. Um, but she said, can I talk to you a minute after you, you know, you're done? I said, yeah, sure. And she said, and I mentioned that about my dad 12-stepping the town drunk. I don't know what snuck out of my mouth that night. And she said, what was that man's name? And I told her. And she said, you know, that's my uncle, and he's still sober. <laughs> he's still sober. And she said, I went home for a family reunion, and that uncle 12-stepped me, and now I have two years. So I got to watch a little ripple hit the bank. And my father had been killed in 99, and this happened a couple years after my dad was gone. I felt a moment of grace. And he... Uh, the joy that comes from having this awakening happen in my life. Yeah, I, want it, I don't want it to be there sometimes. <laughs> like, go away, Joy, go away. I'm having a hard time. My cat's old. She went blind. I don't want to be joyful today. I want to sit with my poor blind cat. Um, <laughs> he's teaching me a lot, actually. Um, I have to help her. She sits with her head against the wall. But she's learning, too. She's learning where the edges of the wall are by, you know, she's not beating herself up so much. She's learning to find the middle of the road, too, because of her instincts. So I'm learning from my cat. But I don't want joy. I don't want joy my father gets killed on his farm and the tractor goes over and kills him in a second. I don't want joy to get on a plane and go home and be of service to my mother. I don't want joy when that man that I loved... Boy meets girl on AA campus. We were young and foolish, and we found God together, and we found working on committees and general service and speaking and panels, and 
I don't want joy when he decides he wants a newcomer in the room, across the room, cheats on me and does what he has to do in his life to go his path. I don't want joy. I don't want forgiveness. I don't want forgiveness when my son is, have come from first communion day. He's little. His first communion day and his father shows up. And his father ends up having a heart attack that day and gets put in the hospital that day. And we get a call, you know, right after we get home, we got to go to the hospital. And I tell my son what his father's going to look like. And, you know, he had moved on from me to the other wife and, you know, whatever. But my son wants to see his dad in the hospital, so we go. I, I don't want the awareness of forgiveness as... We see him, and my son goes out with us. somebody who was there to get something to eat, and I'm there alone with him, and he goes into horrible leg cramps. I, I don't want the awareness to know you rub a leg cramp towards the heart. I don't want to touch him again. But I was there, and I had the awareness, and I had to do that. And the forgiveness came with the awareness. The forgiveness didn't come before. I was still kind of pissed off at him, lying there, tubes or not, you know? So I had the awareness of what to do, and I helped him out until the nurse could get there. And I got to leave a chunk of my pain, which was also in the awareness, in that hospital room. So I walked a freer woman that day. I had more peace in my heart. Uh, I am of the peace generation in the 60s. You know, um, this weekend has been much like a little bit, just rubs a little bit of those 16 four-way hits of orange sunshine that gave me truth once. Um, <laughs> it's been a high that I I want to take out here into the world. You know, I think it's Blake that said when I'm when I'm all done in life, may they throw me on the pyre of life and shove me down the Ganges. May I be all used up. I believe in that. May I be all used up. So passing it on, practicing these principles, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, is so much grace, is so much unearned. I mean, yeah, I did the work, but just God's kid. Tip of my head, the tip of my toes, not a big deal. Just God's kids, clean enough out so that God can love me all the way through me. Um, it takes work for me to stay there, though, in that awareness. I have to eat crow. Every once in a while, I get to taste a crow sandwich to remember what it tastes like. Um, and that's joy. I remember um, seeing an old-timer at the yard. The yard's been talked about. The yard is where my son learned to socialize. The yard is where my my son learned to play volleyball. The artist where Clancy put down his hot dog one day and started batting the ball back and forth over the net with my son because he had tried for years. He was a little guy, and he finally got it over the net, and Clancy noticed and put his hot dog down and went and batted that volleyball across the net with my son, and my son came in fourth in the AYSL Hawaii tournament and first in a tri-state tournament, and you know, that's where my son grew up, was in that yard. And I watched a lot of life happen there. I watched an old-timer call um, somebody else a very dirty word. We get to have to pay for your words there. It was a very dirty word. And at the time, you know, it was in the uh, the 80s, but I think it was still a $5 word. It was that bad. I mean, it was kind of a stream of a word. And <laughs> I thought, you know, I really, I'm really shocked that this happened here. And But I sat back. I sat back and I watched this old timer who I love and respect turn her back. Her She was the color of beet. Her fists were clenched. Walk about 10 feet. I watched something transform. The fists unclenched. She took a breath. I could see her shoulders heave. She turned around and walked back to that person, made immediate amends to that person. And I watched something happen between these two souls right in front of me. It was an awesome experience that I was so glad I was in the moment and aware to see and hear because um, I am fallible. I make mistakes. 
Um, my experience is my truth, though, and giving truth away um, with solution, I think, is kind. Giving truth away without solution, I think, is cruel. And people gave me truth with solution. People gave me love when I didn't feel it, when I didn't understand it, when I hadn't earned it. They just gave me love and softened me piece by piece by piece. So I think I kind of melted it at seven years of sobriety. Being in the coffee shop, wired up with the coffee dribbling down the side of my face where I had no feeling or control, but I had to go to the coffee shop with Mark's mom, June Ann, and Pat, Pat Hodges was there, Pat Lang then, and they're a night to watch me, and I'm dribbling on the table, and I'm sad and sorry, and I have nothing to give, but they're pulling me through anyway, because I'm not drinking, they're keeping me going, and Pat saw me with the puddle on the table, and the dribbling off the side of my mouth because I'm trying to fit in and drink coffee. I can't talk. I have to sit and listen to them complain about their sponsors over and over again. But I saw that look in her eyes like, oh, God, Sharon, look at you. It's like, it's, why do I have to watch her? I was ready for her to just call out at the coffee shop. How come I have to watch her tonight? Can somebody else take this slob, this piece of detritus, and just watch her. It's not what, two nights in a row. It's my. I don't like this. She's a pig. But what she did was she took her napkin and she dabbed my face and put it on the puddle on the table, gave me a wink, and went back to her conversation. And in that moment, a piece fell. I didn't think that. I didn't understand it. I get all kinds of things I don't understand until I wake up in bed two weeks later going, oh, my God, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> was it good for you? It was good for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this new state of consciousness of being aware and bringing it out into the world and bringing it out into the street, you may be the only example that that person sees. You don't know if they're going to need you someday for their sister, their mother. That's that's a powerful cloak to wear loosely, is God's love like that. And about a, two months ago, I was feeling kind of, uh, I was talking to people on the phone, uh, just whine, whine, whine. You know, my boss is looking at me funny, he hasn't come by my door to take me to coffee in a while, you know. Um, and I thought, I'm just going to go out. I need some light. I need some light. Father of light, I need some light. Let me just go find it out in the street. Let me try to practice these principles on my, all my affairs, and I'm going to go get a coffee bean. So I walk out of my office at Century City. It's always a pretty place. It's always warm and sunny in Southern California. And I go up to this light, and um, there's a homeless guy. There's not a lot of homeless people in Century City. Um, and I'm at the punishment light, which uh, doesn't change forever. So <laughs> I'm thinking... Is this what you want me to do, God? You want me to connect here, Father of Light, with this being? Um, and I kind of look at him and smile, and he sneers. <laughs> the light changes. I look across the street. I get my coffee bean. I think, he's there. i got to walk right by him, be back in the building. I just have my card. I don't have my money. I can't give him anything. And Remember that guy that you rolled up your window and he tried to spin on you, that last one? Well... This one might punch you, you know. I'm playing the scenario in my head. And I thought, well, I have the hot coffee. I can throw it if he tries to hurt me. And this is just a couple weeks ago, you know, <laughs> my, my entertainment. And um, let's jack it up with caffeine. It gets more fun. Um, so I'm standing there, and i got to walk right by him when I go. So I walk in, and he's, I get to him, and I turn, and I thought, okay, and he smiles at me. And I thought, he's going to ask me for money. I don't have any. Maybe I can give him my coffee. I don't know. He looks at me. He goes, he looks down at my feet and points. And he says, cute shoes. The homeless guy dug my shoes. <laughs> I just had to walk out there and smile and walk by and click clop. And he liked my shoes. That was all he needed. And... Um, I just laughed. I thought that was such a fun story. I just thought God has got such a sense of humor that um, 
I like to do that. I like to walk out in the street and test it every once in a while. Um, but when people ask you how you are, I really don't tell them because <laughs> we scare them away um, much of the time. So practicing these principles has given me a new energy. Working with others has given me a new energy. Um, having a morning awakening has given me a new energy. Um, I do sponsor a lot of women. I got to go back to the international in New Orleans when I was almost five years sober, and just how you had cleaned me up physically was powerful enough for them to put the buzz out in the French Quarter. You should see what that A&A has done with Mama Cher. You know, you should see how she looked. She wouldn't recognize her, and they didn't recognize me. And I did try to give the big book to one of my old roommates who didn't recognize me, and I did try to 12-step one of my old drinking pals. Um, and she was drunk, and I had to do up her little uniform, and she was coming out on my bed at the Hyatt, and I'm trying to 12-step her, and she's drunk with the big book, just tucked in there. Um, I didn't hear from her until 22 years ago. And she called me and told me she had gotten sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I sponsor that woman today. And we know each other from the darkness, and we know each other in the light. And it's such a gift to have Robin in my life and to see what she has done, the miracles she has changed. She's moved all over the country because of her husband's job, and she has created sponsorship chains and put her gold tapestry and pe thread in people's tapestries throughout the country, and I, uh, I just had a small piece. I just gave her her first big book. That was all. And the joys of that kind of um, new way of being, the new consciousness that I try to live, um, faith-based, not fear-based, God's world, not my world, um, is a job. Um, I, I do like growing things, and I do like helping people weed their soil. And you know, one of my big awarenesses in sobriety was um, <laughs> you work with somebody for a long time. You work with somebody for a long time. You tell them the same thing over and over again, over and over again. They come home from a meeting at 11 o'clock at night, and they ring your phone. And they go, "Guess what Cindy said at the meeting?" <laughs> you know, it's like you want to say, "I've been I've been telling you about that grass is greener for a year here." Um, <laughs> I just, I remember that happening, and I just kind of held the phone up to God, and I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't care where. My job is just to keep them in the room and keep them entertained until it can happen. And um, it's such a beautiful thing. What we do what I can't do. You know, we do what I can't do. My logs burn bright today. I was an ember when I came in here, an ember. <laughs> Little ember. Barely going, there was no great fact within me, somewhere buried down in all that sickness. It was there, making the ember burn, but you guys put that kindling on. You gave me love. You gave me a place to stay. You gave me a chance. You gave me a comfortable, safe environment with which I could come and sit and unclench my fists and take, put my hitchhiking thumb under me, take my running shoes off, take the pack. Oh, Be Here Now was my book in my pack. Baba Ram Das didn't know a thing about being here now. Heavy, heavy, heavy spirit. Ember of life held out as I walked up to my first meeting. And y'all threw some con just kindling on it. And one of the first pieces was my first speaker said, don't remember anything else. And he always waited for the spaceship to land and say, you can come home now, Bill. Oh, a spaceship watcher. Good. And that little ember got a little fired up. And today, we've shared logs, and I burn bright. Father of light in my life is Father of light. Shot through me, whether I want to feel it or not, whether I know, whether I want to do it or not, I have a higher being that I honor and respect and is louder than my head. When I went home once and my father after the 4th of July, one of those perfect days where the Milky Way was out and the fireflies were up and we had, uh, you know, we had been to the 
hay wagons. We had been to the watermelon seed spitting contest. We had been to the apple pie eating contest. It was like a great Iowa day. It was really brought my son home to see it. Come home and meet your grandparents. Know what you're from. I got to do that with my kids because the higher self said, let him know his heritage. I'm so glad he got to know my father. I'm so glad my dad put him on his shoulders and walked through those cornfields. But one of those perfect Fourth of July days, and it's just, I'm sweeping up after we had been doing some fireworks after the big display, and we've been doing the snakes and the sparklers, and I noticed my son and I both writing dirty words, you know, the sparklers. <laughs> so I was kind of sweeping up the driveway, and the Thule fog is coming up, and the fireflies are out, and the Milky Way is bright. And my dad comes out and starts to share his emotions about what it felt like going through his bypass surgery, what it felt like not being part of the community anymore in the capacity he was, what it felt like getting older. And he's sharing his emotions with me. I don't know if that ever happened. And the first thing I wanted to do my consciousness wanted to do was to give him these 12 steps so that he could work it emotionally in his life. The arrogance of that. But somewhere in all of that moment, my God said, just shut up and listen. Just shut up and listen. And I got to do that with my father, who trusted me with his emotions till he was taken. Where do you get that kind of grace and innocence back? Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. You showed me where the tools were, where to pick them up. Okay, work your own muscles, Sharon. They're weak. Work them. Pick up that wrench. It's heavy. Yeah, but we know what you do with it. You go use it here. Okay. You know what to do with that screwdriver. We showed you. Now pick it up and do it. That saw, you got to saw it, girl. You saw us do it. You got to do it. And that's my job. My job is to show the girls that I sponsor, anybody else who needs it, where the tools are. They're spiritual tools. And life has been amazing in my 31 years. And I'm not done yet. That's the beauty. Every speaker has talked about that. We are the seekers. We are the ones who want more. I would have drank with you guys, I think. Wild and crazy bunch. So I am really grateful, even though sometimes it's painful that I'm connected with you. There's a, um, <laughs> there is an aspen grove in Colorado that is on one huge root system. Obviously, I like trees and plants. Can you tell? Um, I don't kill them anymore. I've learned how to love them. Um, but it's on such a huge root system, you can see it from space. And that aspen grove is one big root system where the old trees in the middle, who only get the sunlight on the top, need the nourishment of the little trees on the outside, which pull in fresher soil, more fertile soil more light that they need, because they're all light. They're pulling it into the old ones, and the old ones bring the light that's closer to God, to the heavens, down to the root system and bring it out to the little ones. And we're all that connected. So what I do in life, whether you're watching or not, affects Alcoholics Anonymous, and I honor that and I respect that. And I used to think that freedom was just another word for nothing left to lose. Um, I know that freedom is being a link in the chain of Alcoholics Anonymous. Freedom is letting God into my heart in a, in a way that is indeed miraculous, as it says. Um, and the how and why of it, I think, is finding the new people, finding those who are still suffering from the disease of alcoholism. Go out and fly fish. Put your waders on. Go out and get uncomfortable. 
Don't have a car that's too nice or new that someone can't throw up in the back seat. Remember where you came from. I absolutely love to watch the light go on in someone's eyes. I have a woman that's here this weekend with me who I've gotten to watch the light go on in her eyes. Such renewing of faith. And as that little boy said to his little new sister, what I get is, quick, tell me about God. I'm starting to forget. I get to sit right next to God when I watch the light go on. A miracle is where I have to do the preparation. The coincidences happen and God does the introduction. It happens in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It happens out in the world. I am a good member of my community. I am a good member of my job or Joe job, wife or no wife, new car or no new car. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, shined up and suited up, whether you're watching or not, because that's, that's how I've been touched. That's what's been given to me, is the innocence of a brand new life. So I hope that each of us take from here our little gift that's been wrapped. God tied the bow. We can't keep it unless we give it away. Shine it up. Let it happen. That's my freedom and that's my joy, is that I get to be a little piece in the tapestry of each one of your lives. And I love you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.